Hi, I'm Jill walker Ratberg, a professor of digital culture at the University of Bergen. I'm going to tell you about a methodology I developed for analyzing how data flows, how data works and is situated in social media apps and digital platforms. The method is called situational data analysis because it's really emphasizing how data is situated. It's looking at how data is situated both in terms of where the data comes from, what is this data, what does the data stand for, but also how is the data shown to an audience? Is it represented to humans, to many humans, um, or is it being used by machines and computers? And I'm going to show you, first of all, a short video that actually sort of um, compresses the ideas in this methodology. And then for the next half hour, I'll tell you a bit more about um, the details of how to do this, give you some examples of different ways you can apply the methods, and um, finish off by asking some questions. Social media and big data are drastically shaping our lives and our world by exerting two types of power upon us. On one hand, they exert disciplinary power, shaping our choices through internalized norms. For example, maybe you learn that smiling a certain way in selfies gets more likes. So you start smiling that way every time you take a selfie, even if you're not going to share it. On the other hand, social media wields an environmental power our digital environment manipulates our behavior by making it easier to do some things and harder to do other things. For example, your Facebook feed adjusts its content based on your online shopping habits and everything else Facebook knows about you. Big Data often claims to show us everything from an external, objective point of view. But as described by Donna Haraway, this God trick is impossible. Knowledge is only ever partial and is always situated in a specific context. Therefore, research from Professor Jill Walker Retberg uses situated data analysis, which helps us see through the God trick to uncover the encoded power relationships within our data. It's a new method for analyzing how data are constructed and then presented back to us in different ways. For example, with situated data analysis, we can identify that Strava, a fitness tracking app, situates the data it collects into four layers. One, users see their own data in the app. Two, anyone can see the global data in data visualizations. Three, city planners can buy access to a dashboard for a specific city. And four, the data are processed as zeros and ones by algorithms and could be used by a navigation app to recommend the best route through a city. The first two layers are representations of data which people need to be able to understand large amounts of data. But in the last two layers, the data become operational. They do something rather than just being shown to someone. And this leads to more environmental kinds of power. Situated data analysis gives us tools to analyze social media platforms and apps with the knowledge that data are always constructed and situated. Social media
The next important uh, concepts are operational versus representational data or media. Now, these are concepts that um, have been recently introduced to understand the difference between images that represent something to an audience, so that show us something, or images that do something. So most images that we've been used to up until recently have been representations. Paintings in an art gallery, photographs on our walls at home are all representational. Their primary purpose is to show us something. But digital images are often operational. They do something instead. So they're being used by computation in order to achieve some kind of purpose. The idea of operational images was introduced by the filmmaker Haran Faroqi um, and theorized more by Trevor Paglin, the artist. And then Ode Hall wrote a really useful review of the, of the concept, uh, connecting it to more different theoretical takes on images. Um, she called then for a theory of operational media. And in many ways, this is what Mark Andrzejewicz offers in his book, An Automated Media from 2019 where he argues that all automated media are operational. So now he's not just talking about images anymore, the way Faroqi and Paglin were. He's talking about media as something that might be representational or it might be operational. So I see these terms as being on a bit of a continuum. You can have media that is rep purely representational, media that is purely operational, but a lot of them are going to be in between. So these two um, pairs of spectrum, operational and representational, and excuse me, the um, environmental versus the disciplinary power are two um, sets of concepts that belong together in the situated data approach. The third really important um, theoretical concept, of course, is that of the situated data. And this comes from Donna Haraway's concept of situated knowledge, where the whole point is that you can't actually see everything. You can't access everything, all the data, all the knowledge from a privileged, objective, outside point of view. It's always going to be partial. It's always going to be situated. And so situated data analysis tries to uh, investigate how the data we're looking at is situated and constructed. I started developing the situated data analysis methodology when I was writing about Strava, which is a fitness app that many of you have probably tried. So it's an app you install on your phone. Um, you use it to, to track your runs or your cycling trips or skis or whatever. Um, and it, ex it, it gathers data about you as an individual, also about all the other users, and it presents this data in uh, different ways. Um, so, it, for instance, this is what the individual user sees on their phone um, when they, they go for a run, for instance. You start it off by, you, you see this, how fast you're running right now, there's a big red button, you can swipe and see a map of where you've been, and after your run, then you can see a map along with a summary of it. But Strava also shows the global aggregate data of all the users in this way. This is the global heat map. I'm zooming in on Bergen, which is where I live. And this is a kind of a map of Bergen, but where the, the lit up roads that are highlighted here are where people cycle and where they walk. So if you were familiar with Bergen, you might realize that, hey, this is actually not the typical map we see of where cars drive, where roads are. This is the hiking paths. And you can see that there are hiking paths. People walk around the mountains um, up to the, on the right-hand side here. And it's a lot of people walk by the, by the water side, which is not where the cars go. Here's a juxtaposition of the Strava heat map at the top and the same area in Google Street Maps. And you can see that there are very different emphases in this. But this is drawn from user data. So it's drawn from the data of millions of individual users of Strava who are logging their own, their own individual runs and not, necessar not necessarily thinking about that data as also contributing to a larger map. Now, this is still a representation, right? Well, I should have said that in the first place. The first level of, um, 
of Strava, the stuff you see on your own phone about your own um, data, that's a representation of your data, although you can still do some things with it. It will calculate speeds, it will calculate personal records and stuff like that. So there's the definite the data visualization, which is a representation, but also some elements of operation. And at this level, um, there are some power things being enacted uh, bec because you're using this app it was very much as a technology of the self in order to become fitter, in order to sort of build some habits of fitness. Um, and these are, of course, norms that society wants us to be fit and healthy and productive, right? Um, but there are also things we're doing to ourselves, we're internalizing us. And so this representation of our own activity is strengthening and reinforcing those internalized norms. So it's a disciplinary kind of power. The um, global heat map that we see here is also representational. Its primary audience is definitely human beings, not computers. Um, but obviously the data has been aggregated and it's been also, um, it's starting to do something, right? It's starting to say, okay, these are the most popular areas. It's starting to become data that could be used for something more than, um, than just for looking at. The next level of data is the Strava Metro dashboard. Now here the data has become really quite operational. This is a level that most users of Strava never see. It's the aggregate data from all the Strava users, but presented in a form for city planners, um, architects, um, health professionals, etc. Um, where this data is offered to them as a way of, of strategizing, of analyzing um, footpath, I'm um, sorry, cyclists, um, how they move through the town, how uh, pedestrians move through the town in order to improve the city, uh, the architecture, where the roads go, etc. So at this level, I mean, obviously this is, we're seeing data visualizations. This is an image meant for humans to read, um, but the data can be doing more. It's much, there's a much stronger emphasis on the operationality here. This also and carries with it a shift towards environmental power because here people are the city planners are using this data now in order to actually change the city to um, to enhance the kinds of activity that they want to build cycle paths in places so as to encourage cycling for instance now the fourth level of data of situated data that I looked at in Strava is hard to represent visually because it's where we're really only dealing with machines. And this is where the data from Strava users is being used by um, by being used by algorithmic systems in order to generate navigation apps for cyclists for instance. Um, and so at this point there is really no visual interface to the data as such. It is purely operational. And the original users who, who generated their data may have absolutely no idea that it's being used in this way. So as you can see here, you've got the individual data um, generated by the individuals who actually, in the case of Strava, really want to share this data. They want to be able to see their own runs reflected back to them in this way. Uh, the individual data is aggregated um, and made global, so and this, then that aggregate data is displayed for two different audiences. On the one hand, humans, where it's represented, and on the other hand, a machine audience, which uses it to do operations. So we have the, we can draw up this spectrum. We've got the individual data, the aggregate data, human audience, machine audience. Um, now, along with this, we get different kinds of power. With the human audience, the data is usually representational. It's used to show things to us. And so up there, you have the data visualizations, right? With the machine audience, the data is operational. It's being used for computation. And so there might not be an image at all. The human audience, or the, the data visualizations, where it's more representational, tends to um, carry with it a more disciplinary power, whereas the more operational data that's being um, used by a machine audience tends to carry with it a more environmental So that was Strava. But I think you could do a situated data analysis about the data flows in almost any digital platform or social media. I think what you'd need to do first, 
you want to identify the different levels in the platform. And with Strava, I found four levels. Um, you might find other levels in whatever you're looking at. I think you should consider the data sources. Where does the data in this platform come from? Is it from an individual user? Is it aggregate data? Do people know they're sharing this data? Um, also consider the intended audience. Is the audience for this data an individual user or a group of humans or all humans? Or is it actually machines? And using these different categories, you will be able to find different levels that you would like to focus on in your analysis. So once you've identified your levels in the app or the platform, then you want to ask questions about this data to try to find out how it's situated, how it's constructed. So start by looking at what the data is. What's the data that's being shown or used in this level of your platform? Is the data actually a proxy for something else? For instance, if it's data about people's smiles that is a proxy for how they feel, or um, maybe there's data about how often a door is opened and shut, and that's a proxy for whether people are entering um, a building. What's being left out? You can be sure that if data has been collected, then something is not being collected. So what are those things that are not collected? What's not shown in your data sample here? Is the data at this level being used in a representational way? That is, is it showing stuff to humans? Or is it operational, so doing stuff, being computed in some way? And what kinds of power are supported at this level? Disciplinary power, environmental power, maybe other kinds of power altogether. So let me give you one more example very quickly just to give you an idea of how situated data analysis could be applied to a different kind of platform. Um, so this is, the example here is how selfies are shared on a social network site, like for instance, Facebook. Um, so images are a kind of data. Um, they're clearly analyzed and m machine read by Facebook or whatever platform we were talking about. So a situated data analysis of selfies would look at how the image data is situated for different audiences and what the data sources actually are. Now, when you take your selfie and upload it to Facebook or to Instagram, you're creating a representation of yourself. You've probably taken selfies many times before, and you've probably learned what camera angles and facial expressions tend to look best and get you the most likes. Maybe you're more likely to get likes if you post a selfie of yourself with your friends, or in front of a tourist attraction, or with your cat, or wearing makeup. And probably what works best depends on your particular community or your group of friends. So you've internalized certain norms about selfie taking and their disciplinary norms that are reinforced by the likes and comments that you get on your selfies. So at this level, the taking of the selfie, there's a disciplinary power of sorts. This is the first layer where your selfie is situated as a representation of yourself that you share with your friends or a broader audience. Facebook and Instagram and other platforms will also show your selfie to other people for their own purposes, of course. And, and you know that, you're uploading it to some Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and of course you'd like people to see it and to click like on it, right? Um, but Facebook's goal is to make a profit. They want to um, increase engagement, they want to have your friends look at your selfie a lot so that they'll also see ads so that Facebook can make money from the advertisers. Um, so here at this level, your selfie is situated differently. Now it's a piece of content that's being shown to other users. And there's an environmental power happening here. The environment, which in this case is the social media feed, is being altered in order to change people's behavior. For instance, I might pause to look at your selfie and then happen to notice the ad next to it. And Facebook would love it if I would click that ad. So in this case, the data is represent the data, that is the selfie. It's still, or the selfies, many selfies. The selfie is still representational. Humans are definitely viewing it, but it's also becoming operationalized because Facebook is also using it in order to um, 
generate advertising content. And we also know that Facebook also does image analysis of selfies and other photos people upload. For instance, um, identifying individuals who are tagged in it so that they can show that selfie to the other people. Um, but also doing things like analyzing what objects are in the photograph if there's a particular theme. You'll often notice on Facebook that um, if it's snowing then um, and someone, some friend shows a picture of the snow, then the next picture might well be of the snow as well. So Facebook does sort our pictures based on topics that it sees in there. So here um, there's a disciplinary power because we're still, you know, learning about face what kind of selfies. Is, there is some sort of internalized stuff going on here, but there's also more um, environmental power because we are actually being encouraged to engage with certain selfies, with certain content that Facebook very much presents in a certain way in order to get us to engage with it. So the third level is really purely operational. And this is actually outside of Facebook or Instagram. This is the data that was on Facebook or, or Instagram, all of our selfies, but now it's been scraped by other services. And my two examples here are Clearview and um, the image generation uh, algorithms. So you've probably heard of Clearview by now. They scraped, um, was it 3 million or 3 billion? A lot of selfies and private photographs clearly um, breaking GDPR and ethical considerations, but they now have a huge database that they've trained on many, many um, images from social media and that they use for facial recognition, which is being used by a lot of police departments, by governments and um, other entities. So at this level, the user has no control over how their data is being used, but it could still have quite an impact on their life. Another use of um, scraped images from social media is that they've been used as training data to generate new faces. And um, here you can see how, um, how based on a huge training data set of faces, selfies, etc., um, you can use GAN networks in order to generate new faces that aren't actually faces of any individual, but they're generated from this other data set. So these are just two examples of how that selfie data can be operationalized in a different way. So here the data is not really operational. I mean, I'm showing you a screenshot of Clearview and a video of what those um, face generations could look like. But the point here is your selfie is being um, algorithmically analyzed. It's not being shown to other humans at this point. Um, and the power here is environmental because these sorts of apps are actually changing our environment and causing um, behavior that is um, different to what we might have done otherwise. It's not something that we could even be aware of internalizing. I just finished reading Kate Crawford's new book, Atlas of AI, and its chapters are elegantly divided into something that looks a bit like the levels that I've been talking about, but that Crawford calls journeys or places. Um, now, you could imagine organizing a situated data analysis, as Kate Crawford has done here. But on the other hand, you could also say this goes way beyond the data. So Crawford looks at um, the level such as the earth, in order for AI to exist, you need to extract lithium and other minerals from the, work, from the earth and destroy the environment in order to build the computers and the batteries. She, um, she looks at labor and how workers are exploited throughout the world in order to generate uh, the AI technologies that we uh, take for granted. 
Uh, she looks at data, which of course is exactly what the situated data approach is looking at. So this part is so um, relevant. Classification and how those epistemological assumptions actually decide what AI can do. And at affect, emotion recognition, and at state and how governments and the military um, maneuver uh, AI technologies. So you could um, try to do a situated data analysis based on completely different uh, levels such as these, perhaps. So I think the value of situated da data analysis is that it really encourages you to think of data as something which is always constructed, always partial, but we can understand in different ways. I think dividing it into levels, looking at how this data is actually represented, used in different ways for different audiences at different levels, I think that's really helpful. It also is um, a very sort of um, uh, open method that fits with very, very many other methodologies. You could approach any of these lef any of these levels um, using methodologies like ethnography or semiotic analysis or um, explicitly feminist or or critical race race theory um, approaches. And in the paper, I, I go through some of the ways in which this could be used. I also think it speaks quite well to other methods like the walkthrough method for looking at how uh, a new user to an app would experience it. Um, or Andre Brock's critical technocultural discourse analysis, which, um, which specifically aims to prioritize the epistemological standpoint of underrepresented groups of technology users. So I'm really really looking forward to hearing ways that you think this approach to analyzing digital media and data in particular um, could be used. Um, can it be expanded? Do you see problems? What kinds of platforms would this work with and where might it not work? Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much.